Good afternoon, all. I'm going to get started now. I see a few more people coming in, but let's get going. Uh, I am Kate Foster. I'm president of the College of New Jersey. It's my honor to welcome you to this first panel of a three-part series, Making Sense of the Moment. Many of us reacted with concern and incredulity when on January 6th, we watched the violent storming of the US Capitol by persons seeking to disrupt the certification of the electoral college votes and thus the peaceful transition of power from one US president to another. The moment raised profound questions about the causes of insurrection and the broader reflections and impact on our democracy. We will cover these topics from many angles over the course of the semester. Today in panel one, four TCNJ professors, each from a different discipline, will offer insights and perspectives on the intersection between events of January 6th and the centuries long struggle for an equitable, multiracial, multi-ethnic American democracy. Starting us off will be Dr. Diane Bates from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, who will share demographic data and insights on where we stand as a multiracial and multi-ethnic nation now. She will be followed by Dr. Chris Fisher from the Department of History, who will offer a historical perspective on the moment and interrogate the notion that this is not who we are. Our third speaker is Dr. Zakia Adair from the Departments of African American Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. She will look through the lens of popular culture media to suggest our susceptibility to the moment. Our final panelist today, Dr. Dan Bowen from the Department of Political Science, will conclude with observations on the political incentives that are shaping progress toward a multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. So a little bit of housekeeping. After all four panelists speak, each for up to 10 minutes, we will kick off a discussion informed by your questions and observations. We absolutely invite your curiosities, your probes, your challenges, and please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Enter them as we are going along. I will direct the questions after everyone has spoken, and you may, you may enter your question anonymously, or you may leave your name in your question so that we could specify if you'd like to have that, that your name used. Please know that we are recording the panel and we are also using captions today. If you would like to opt out of the captions, which may be scrolling along the bottom of your screen right now, please go to the live transcript button on the bottom of the screen and simply choose hide subtitles. So with that, let's get to it. Our first speaker is Dr. Diane Bates and Diane, I turn it over to you. I believe you're on mute. I am, thank you, Dr. Foster. Uh, I muted it, my dog has decided that now is the time he wants to bark. So my apologies for that in advance. Um, but my job here is to sort of talk a little bit about the demographic profile of the United States, in part because um, there's, there's widespread sort of understanding that one of the reasons that there was this conflict, um, this insurrection on January 6th, has to do with this question of demographic threat and whether or not the truth of the matter is the United States is changing demographically. And the question is whether or not that is perceived, at least by some, as a demographic threat. So I'm gonna be relying here on some slides. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and I will make this large so everyone can see it. So this is data that's taken from the current population survey, which is a, it's part of the census process. Um, is it coming up? It should be coming up. Let's see, there we go. Um, and so this is taken from 2018. And what you can see here is that if we think about the United States, we are already a multi-ethnic and multi-racial uh, country or state. Um, in the United States, less than six out of every 10 people or three out of every five people, if that's an easier ratio to think about, um, falls into this category of white, non-Hispanic, native born. So that means that two out of every three are not. And in some parts of the country, notably in um, the West, um, this category of white non-Hispanic native born people is already in a numerical minority. Um, and in other parts of the country, like the South, which has the largest population by far, we're getting very close to a 50% mark. The Northeast looks pretty white, but part of that is because the Mid-Atlantic region 
is pretty diverse, but New England is, is actually the, the whitest part of the entire country. Um, and so we have some bias. If you look at New Jersey, for example, we're about 54% white non-Hispanic and we're about 20 to 25% um, foreign born. So we're well below um, that 50% mark here in New Jersey already. So the data is pretty clear that we are already a multiracial and multi-ethnic country. The bigger question is, is, does the, is this perceived as a threat by some people? Um, the threat comes in part because the changing demographics over the next foreseeable future suggests that this white non-Hispanic native born population is gonna be shrinking and shrinking over time. So if we look at immigration, for example, and this is a really oversimplified um, diagram, but one of the things that you can see is that really after World War II, which is this low point for migration or immigration here, is that the groups that are immigrating to the United States are primarily from, and the orange line is Latin America and the Caribbean, the green line is Asia. Um, and then you can even see this growing purple line, which is from continental Africa. And if you see here, actually um, in 2018, which is where this data ends, we had more immigrants from Africa than we had from Europe. So moving forward and pr presuming that we will continue to have immigrants coming to this country after the COVID period ends, um, it is likely that the immigration streams coming to the United States are going to further diversify the US population, particularly since immigrants tend to have larger families, have more children than do native born um, US residents. This is a chart that was put out um, quite a while back, but it's, it's easy to read, so I use it um, and it projects race and ethnicity into the middle of, the, of this century to 2015. And one of the things that you can sort of notice is that if you look at the, the sort of gray bars at the bottom, that represents white non-Hispanic. And you can see that proportionately over time, this category of Americans is gonna be declining proportionate to the actual population of the United States. Um, Black African-Americans are relatively stable with the increase coming um, at least in part due to immigration from uh, Latin America and Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, Africa. Um, but the two main growing groups or the two largest fastest growing groups are Latin American and Asian, um, both native born and immigrant populations. So over time, we will see fewer white non-Hispanic native born people in the United States as a proportion of the entire US population. Now, some people tend to see that as a threat. Usually it tends to be those very same people whose population is shrinking. Um, and in part that is because this group of people also tends to be the most segregated um, from other racial and ethnic groups within the United States. Um, so when you look at, for example, you might see electoral maps where you sort of see, oh, there's huge chunks of people who vote red in the middle and the coasts tend to be very blue and tend to be more democratic. It's really more of an urban um, rural split than a, than a regional split. But what you find is that white non-Hispanic native borns are much more likely to be living in communities and primarily interacting with people that are also white native born non-Hispanics. Whereas people from more diverse backgrounds and people living in metropolitan areas are much more likely to be interacting with people who are not like them on a regular basis. The reason why this becomes important is that people don't have that firsthand experience with people who are not like them tend to rely on media to sort of build their opinions and their ideas about these groups of which they're unfamiliar. And as we, we know quite well, um, not all of the media is entirely um, unbiased in its reporting on things like immigration, um, the way that crime is reported, for example, in metropolitan areas. So we know that these people are sort of isolated, that these white non-Hispanic, predominantly rural, native born people are much more likely to view changing demographics as a sort of threat. Um, and this is one of the sort of principal underlying ideas behind um, some elements of um, the insurrection that happened on um, January 6th. The big question of course, is that how does this multi-ethnic, multi-racial um, reality translate into a political system? Um, and that's an open question. Right now we have a political system that is actually deliberately tilted towards rural states. So you have over representation in the political system um, by rural areas. And this was designed um, into the way that our federal system works. And so part of our question moving forward, I think is whether or not we are committed to a, a democracy, a one person, one vote democracy 
or if we are much more interested in preserving um, the system that we have right now, which um, does privilege sort of rural areas over metropolitan areas, regardless of the changing demographic and the larger populations. So I will leave it there um, and I will stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Bates. I'm going to say that as you're going forward, already a question has come up about the timeliness of those particular projections in the last slide that may be a little older. And how did the current data on and the policies on immigration maybe change that? So hold that thought so that we can get back to and respond to that question, if you would, please. All right. Our next speaker is Dr. Chris Fisher, and he was going to give us some historical perspective. Dr. Fisher. Hi, thank you very much. Um, like Diane, I want to thank Dan and President Foster for organizing this series and asking us to reflect on how to make sense of this moment. Like many of you, I watched the events of January 6th with a mixture of outrage and sadness. The throngs of people standing in angry anticipation at the Capitol were eerily familiar to me. And that such a mob would graduate from manic revelry to outright insurrection was hardly surprising. However, what I did find interesting were the people who claimed that they were actually shocked. Now, that I found very interesting. And at first, I had a hard time circling that square between me and them. I mean, we grew up in the same system held the same values, occupied the same social reality, what explained that disconnect? Well, of course, there was a litany of academics and media personalities who came along to say that it was the hyperpartisan politics of our society, racism and white supremacy, the weaponization of the First Amendment, our obsession with obsessive individualism and or our cultural or rather our culture of distraction that explained that disconnect between myself and them. However, I didn't find any of that satisfying. Instead, what brought everything into focus for me, trying to change to the next slide here, what brought everything into focus for me was what I remember from the scholar and activist and artist W.E.B. Du Bois. You see, Du Bois argued that African-Americans were born with what he called a veil, a mental barrier that prevented black people from uniting the two sides of themselves, being black and being American into a meaningful whole. Because of this, he said, black people suffered from a divided or double consciousness that put them at war with themselves and everything else around it. Now, that's where the typical interpretation of Du Bois ends, but there's much more to the story because he said that double consciousness also came with certain gifts. One was that black people could see what white people could not or simply would not see. Du Bois called this the gift of second sight. And I should note that this idea inspired writers as diverse as Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison to show how Second Sight gave Black people a humanist, a humanist rather, intuition. Putting aside his literary and philosophical significance, I think Du Bois was making a statement about historical awareness. Understanding American history through the lens of Black history sensitizes you to our nation's capacity for explosive and irrational violence. To that end, one historical phenomena stands out particularly clear in my mind. That, of course, is the practice of lynching in American history. To me, it's very clear that January 6th insurgents took their cues from this tortured history. As the picture behind me, of Henry Smith's lynching in 1893, as that picture demonstrates, there were striking symmetries in structure, style, and performance of both events. And make no mistake about it, 
For the lynch mob and the January 6th insurrectionists, performance was a vitally important part of the act. Like the lynching rituals, the insurrectionists wanted to give the impression that their actions were spontaneous. But to the people leading the event, the politicians, the white supremacists, the militia, they understood and appreciated the orchestrated nature of what was taking place. First, it began with the planning, which started weeks in advance through a bus tour in middle America and warnings that the meeting in Washington would be a reckoning to restore justice. January 6, or rather like January 6, lynchings were advertised well in advance, weeks in advance as an act of restorative justice. When in reality, they were equal parts vigilantism and carnival. Second was the choreography of the event itself. With so many people expecting a show, the organizers whipped up the crowd, played to their passions and provoked their fury. Finally, was the use of symbolism. The symbolism was used, symbolism rather was used in order to give everyone a shared sense of why they was there, why they were there. Though the symbolism was muddled on January 6, with Confederate flags, QAnon insignia, and evangelical crosses, there was a common sent sentiment rather of being justified by right, tradition, and or God. So that's where I landed with my lack of surprise about January 6. Everything inside of me knew as a scholar and as a black person that when these conditions come together, particularly among white Americans, more often than not, it's to deadly effect. That so many Americans, particularly white Americans, could not or would not connect those very dots suggested that we were dealing with a larger issue of either ignorance or chauvinism in our society. I actually put my money on both. In fact, I'm willing to bet that many of those quote unquote surprised people would be aghast at my assess assessment of their historical awareness and instead would complain about how we teach American history. The problem they might say is that we've traded good history for identity politics and political correctness. And because of that, they've just tuned it out. And I'm sure some might defend their position with some version of quote unquote, why should I learn someone else's history over my own? To them, black history is an unfair imposition on an uplifting story. But this is where Du Bois matters because such chauvinistic responses lose sight of the doubleness of our consciousness. Black, po black folk rather, like all disempowered people must learn and respect the history of the dominant group to do otherwise is dangerous. In addition, Du Bois matters because such proud disregard of other people's history, especially among whites, although not exclusively, weakens the United States because it gives a pass to the real threat to our republic. And that threat is the false consciousness of the privileged majority. So how do we make sense of this moment? I think it's a wake up call for us to see what's already in front of our faces. I think it's another reminder that none of this is new because as Diane Bates pointed out, we've been talking about the conditions that led up to January 6th for a long time. I think it also brings into focus the significance of learning something about another, group, another group's part in the American story. Black History Month is such an occasion, but so is Women's History Month. Hispanic Heritage Month, among other acknowledgements. I think we do ourselves a disservice when we only focus on the grievance in those histories and not what an honest reflection about their questions might offer. And I think what it offers is a chance for us to consider how we might improve this experiment in democracy. I know that was a lot, but I hope we keep those considerations in our minds as we continue this series. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. I should say that um, some questions are beginning to come in and I'm going to hold them, but thank you for that really nice historical parallels that you, you brought to us. And also a little story about our tendencies as people. So that's, that's really terrific. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Zakia Adair, and I will turn over the floor to her right now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I also want to thank Dan and also President Foster for organizing this event. Um, I am very happy to be included in the conversation and uh, what I hope will be um, a more in-depth conversation during the question and answer period. So Dan asked us to try to make sense of the attack um, on the Capitol and what it means to struggle for a multiracial, multi-ethnic, American democracy. Personally, I've had a hard time keeping track of what day it is, but I do know that I went to bed on January 5th content with the results of the runoff election in Georgia. I awoke January 6th to a deluge of information that concerned me. Then I saw footage from the Capitol that terrified me. I saw a deluded, joyous throng of protesters invade hallowed halls with nefarious purpose. Their exuberance was familiar. I had seen it before, most often in works of fiction and in the terrorist acts that inspired it. I was reminded that six months prior, almost to the day, that President Trump had ordered William Barr to clear peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters with military might so that he could enjoy a macabre faceless photo op. As a Black woman, a feminist, and a scholar of African-American cultural history, what stood out to me was how the rioters used pop culture in their spectacle. For me, these are useful access points to begin the conversation on the relationship between pop culture and politics. So let's talk about three examples of pop culture and media entertainment that have shaped white nationalist thought in the 20th through the 21st century. First up, let's start with a fictional work, D.W. Griffith's racist propaganda film, Birth of a Nation. Birth of a Nation, which was released in 1915 and was based on the novel by Thomas Dixon Jr. The three hour movie drew from the Lost Cause narrative, which asserts that the Confederacy was noble and the institution of slavery just, wherein angry white men band together and form the Ku Klux Klan to save America from being taken over by black people. In one of the most dramatic scenes of the, the movie, a white woman jumps off a cliff to her death to escape a black man who is chasing her. His intent to rape is made clear in the grotesque gestures of the white actor dressed in blackface. Despite protests against the film by Black Americans, President Wilson held a private screening at the White House and was widely reported to have loved the film. The violent delights of the film had devastating consequences. As Dr. Fisher mentioned before, lynchings we were already rampant throughout the United States post-abolition and post-emancipation. Um, but after Birth of a Nation, there was a marked increase in the number of lynchings of Black Americans. In addition to that, there was a huge increase in individuals uh, wanting to join the now new formed with uniforms, KKK. So next up, I wanna talk about uh, a work, another work of fiction, a novel. The Turner Diaries was published by William Luther Pierce under his pseudonym, Andrew McDonald. The Turner Diaries is an apocalyptic novel about an American revolution that starts when white Americans attack the Capitol to overthrow the government of the United States. The group also murders all non-white Jewish people, all non-white individuals and Jewish people. This film, um, this novel rather, has shaped white nationalist groups from the late 20th century through to today. In 1995, for example, Timothy McVeigh bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people, uh, many of whom were children. McVeigh cited the Turner Diaries as his blueprint for the attack. Most recently, and I will talk about in a moment, Proud Boys, one of the many uh, diverse white nationalist separatist groups to participate in the attacks on the Capitol, has incorporated aspects of the novel and the group's activism. Finally, 
a work of nonfiction. The image behind me is an image taken of the Proud Boys, which is um, a, a mix of uh, men's rights activists as well as white nationalist supremacists. So embedded within their ideology is a misogynistic hate for uh, pretty much everyone except for white men. Um, so <laughs> the work of a nonfiction, the anthology post of social media platform. So Parler was founded in 2018, and it's often been described as the Twitter for right-wing extremists. It has millions of users, and many of them espouse theories like uh, QAnon. So in the years leading up to the attack, so this didn't just happen overnight, as Dr. Fisher has said, in the years leading up to the attack, um, many users of Parler uh, were posting conspiracy theories over and over and over again. And um, the actor user base increased year by year up to about 15 million at the time of the attack on the Capitol. So the reason I've included Parler alongside two examples of fiction and pop culture is because the content of each has been used by extremists to justify their violent actions, be it Klan raids in the South and lynching of uh, Black people, Timothy McVeigh's domestic terrorism, or most recently, the insurrection of the Capitol. So what does all of this mean for the struggle for a multiracial, multi-ethnic society? I think it means that pop culture has a huge impact on political movements, that white domestic terrorists are well-organized, funded, and supported. And I also think it means that we need to have a larger conversation about the blurred line between fact and fiction. I hope we can get into a deeper conversation about this as we go on today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adair. Thank you also for drawing sort of a through line across the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, so as we think about these access points through po popular culture, you use film, print, and virtual. We will uh, have batting cleanup today as Dr. Dan Bowen. He will be our fourth panelist, and then we're going to be opening it up for a number of questions that continue to come in. So thank you for those. Uh, Dr. Bowen. Thank you, Dr. Foster, and thank you, fellow panelists, for helping us think through what transpired on the 6th. I'd like to focus our attention for a few minutes on the Republican Party. My argument is that the Republican Party is a broken party. It is a party in crisis, and its crisis is a direct cause of our national crisis and the Capitol insurrection. I know th that was strong language, uh, but, but, but hear me out. That might seem like a strange comment about a highly competitive political party, which just two years ago had unified control over the federal government and its strength across state governments. So what do I mean that the party is in crisis? The GOP is a racially and ethnically homogeneous party in a rapidly diversifying country. It is committed to a set of unpopular public policies that's supported by its shrinking electoral coalition. The party also struggles to maintain that coalition, which demands fidelity to an unactionable anti-government agenda. We don't have much time to discuss the full history of the current party system, um, so I'm not going to. Uh, but I will just say really briefly that Republicans in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s made drastic gains, particularly in the US South and among conservative white Southerners. As the Democratic Party embraced an expansion of rights, most notably through the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, some Southern whites were upset about this and moved into the Republican Party particularly those who are both economically conservative and who did not support further government action to help ensure political and economic equality for black Americans. Political scientists have referred to such voters as racially resentful voters. Nixon and Reagan welcomed these voters into the party, securing a switch with the Democrats on matters of uh, issues of race uh, and diversity and aligned um, uh, or secured the realignment of the U.S. South into the Republican Party. This was an historic success, electorally speaking, for Republicans. It led to uh, winning the, the presidency, um, eventually the, the, the Senate in the 1980s, 
the U.S. House in the 1990s, which, which Republicans had won for 50 years, and then historic gains among state legislatures across the country. However, the demographic trends that Dr. Bates discussed earlier have really serious implications for the Democratic and Republican parties. The Democrats over time, uh, but not without their own internal conflicts, have become a truly multiracial, multiethnic coalition, as you can see in the uh, chart that I have behind me. The Republican Party did not, and it remains just as racially homogeneous today as it was in the early 1990s. You can see this in, in the screen I have from the American National Election Study. Without diversifying the party, the GOP faces an increased pressure to maintain a coalition that's able to win national elections. Younger generations, which are more diverse, as Dr. Bates was explaining, um, particularly with larger percentages of Latinx and Asian Americans, are also more democratic than the generations they are replacing. That's what this graph behind me shows. This is a shrinking coalition. Uh, and, it, and the party represents a stagnant policy agenda as a part of this coalition. You may not believe me, but just let's just talk for a second about policy commitments. A clear majority of Americans believe that climate change is a problem, support higher tax, tax rates for upper income people, support the Affordable Care Act and want a public option as a part of the Affordable Care Act, want stricter gun control and legalize marijuana, favor LBGTQ non-discrimination protections, voice support for Black Lives Matter, say that racism is a problem in the United States, and support a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. I'm not making value statements about those policy platforms. What I'm saying is it's a big problem for a party if many of the major issues facing the country, uh, the party is committed to the minority position. To exacerbate these challenges, the party has allowed, or even encouraged, or even farmed out its own intellectual and ideological control to media personalities in talk radio and in cable, right? Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram and the like. But Sean Hannity doesn't have to make uh, uh, difficult political compromises. And Rush Limbaugh has a luxury of not changing his policy positions if he doesn't want to. Right? Um, this poses a huge problem for Republicans who are trying to govern when political compromise is necessary. It's a serious problem. So how has the party tried to deal with these problems so far? Well, uh, what it's mainly done is it has tried to maintain their, its, its coalition um, and win elections largely by leveraging the anti-majoritarian aspects of the US political system instead of and, and in place of changing their policy commitments to attract different kinds of voters. They have won the presidency twice in the past 20 years through the electoral college, despite losing the popular vote. They almost did it a third time in 2020. Their strength in the US states, particularly lower population, more rural states, has enabled control of the US Senate, or at least enough senators to block major legislation. State control has allowed the party to gerrymander single member districts for state legislatures in Congress, a time-honored tradition that both parties regularly uh, participate in. But this has allowed them to maximize their political power relative to their electoral strength. Finally, and most importantly for what happened um, in the 2020 election and the insurrection, political elites in the Republican Party have used groundless claims about voter fraud to delegitimize Democratic votes and avoid a reckoning about the party's policy stances. It's so much easier to believe that the Democrats cheated and that your op opinions were unpopular. Fraud claims carry the added benefit for Republicans that they can be used to grow support for passing restrictive voting laws like strict photo ID requirements or removing no excuse uh, absentee mail balloting. By the way, uh, the scholarship on voter fraud arguments uh, shows that they've been most effective among racially resentful white Americans and those with high anti-immigrant sentiment. Right, so these messages are targeting particularly voters who are upset about the diversification of the country. Finally, other scholarship has found evidence that Republican state legislatures in electorally competitive states are the ones that are most likely to pass restrictions. 
It's not integral to the Republican Party platform. It's being used in places uh, where Republicans are really trying hard to win elections and who may not win elections. But we witnessed in the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election and the insurrection, I think, was an extreme and dangerous version of this same playbook. An attempt to force Republican state and federal officials to use anti-majoritarian, in this case actually illegal, means to hold power. Claims of voter fraud are rooted in the deliberate delegitimization of Black and Latinx voters, particularly in urban areas, exactly the sorts of areas that few Republican votes come from and Republican officials do not represent. Republican officials have gone along with Trump's attempted insurrection in various degrees, not all of them, um, and not all the same way, but they've done so, I think, because they don't see a viable pathway to victory without his supporters in the current Republican Party. And I think that the further partisan sorting of Trump supporters into the party and Trump opponents out of the party will make this problem worse and not better in the short term. In the hours that followed the January 6th attack, a majority of House Republicans voted to challenge the results in Pennsylvania elections, just hours after the images that uh, Chris and Zakia were showing us. Later, nearly all of House Republicans and, and most of the Senate voted not to impeach a president who quite literally encouraged a mob to intimidate or even kill them. I don't know what other evidence we need to see that the party's incentive structure is deeply broken, allowing and even fueling the rad radicalization of the public and of the party's elected officials. And I believe that is the most pressing challenge to American democracy that we have seen in generations. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bowen, and thank you, panelists. I think we're gonna to try to bring it back here uh, to see everybody on the screen if we're able to do that. So let's, are we able to get everybody on the screen in the same size? That would be the desire. All right, well, either way, whether we can do that or not, let me, let me um, say that we have, I call for curiosities, probes and challenges, and that's what we have received from a sophisticated audience. So I'll do my best to get through a number of them. I wanna start with uh, a series of questions that came in from different people and see if I can pull them together a little bit because all of them get at the assumptions that our panelists are making about who is in that group of people on January 6th at the US Capitol. So, let me, let me see if I can read a couple of them. This first one, I think uh, Diane Bates, Dr. Bates, I'll let you try it. And Dr. Fisher, I'd like you to come in on this, these as well. But the first one says, without knowing where the people at the Capitol riot came from, other than those arrested, how can you suggest that the people there felt threatened by their shrinking proportions as a population or that they were isolated from other races in their towns? And before you answer, Dr. Bates, I'm gonna put a couple of questions together here. So that specific question about something you had said about sort of the sorting and sifting. Um, a, 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 a similar question says, is it problematic to marginalize the lived experiences of people of color and LGBTQ folk who were at the White House on January 6th? And then a common and a similar question that said, um, I think that actually that might be that might be a good place there. So let's start let's start with those two about sort of protesters who perhaps were there. And maybe the third part of that would be how do we account for protesters who did not storm the Capitol? So what assumptions are we making about who is in that audience? So I'll start with Dr. Bates um, from the sort of demographic sorting sifting point of view, and then I'd like others to be able to jump in. Yeah, I think demographically, one of the things that we look at in that is who supported and who voted for Donald Trump. Um, if we start from the assumption that most of the people who were at the rally prior to storming the Capitol were actually supporters of Donald Trump, there's very little evidence to suggest that there was an infiltration by other groups, although clearly that's, that allegation has been made. Um, but when you look at who actually voted for Donald Trump, it is he has differential support in the same areas where you are, um, you have a concentration of white native non-Hispanic people. Um, if you look at Trump's policies, it makes entire sense. You know, he was anti-immigration. 
He was anti um, sort of civil rights legislation. If you look at things like the rollback of um, things like trans, trans, the trans ban in the military to the rollback on the Voting Rights Act um, and a whole wide variety of different policy positions that President Trump took during his administration. Um, and so given that we know who voted for Trump in 2016, given we know the policies that the Trump administration had, we don't necessarily have the data of who exactly voted for Trump, but the people who voted for Trump in 2020 are very similar to the people who voted in 2016. So there is a sort of um, a speculation of sorts that most of the people who were at that Trump rally were in fact people who supported Donald Trump. Also, if you just simply look at the photographs, it's not as systematic, like I haven't gone through and counted everything, um, but it is a predominantly white group. Uh, I think most of the people who've looked at the crowds have been, the more startling thing is not that it's mostly white, but how many women were involved. Um, and so I think that is a, that's an interesting question in and of itself. But so I do think, you know, there is a certain amount of um, speculation but when you look at the sort of the photographs and you can see, and then you can look back at the, both the electoral history in 2016, the exit polling data that we had in 2020, and then the policy agenda. As far as why do we know that there is this sense of demographic threat, and why people would believe it? Again, it's polling data. It's very clear that it's polling data. And there's been a lot of work that's been done on this um, since 2016. One of the most interesting studies that I saw looked at people who, um, who everyone they knew voted for the person that they voted for. And so we talk, talk about this as being political isolation. So if I voted for Trump, everyone I talked to voted for Trump. So therefore, since everybody that I talked to voted for Trump, there's no way that Trump could have lost. And the people who live in those sorts of communities are much more likely to be in these same sorts of communities that I've just mentioned. Whereas people who are living in much more diverse metropolitan areas what, regardless of their racial or ethnic background. I'm a white non-Hispanic native born person, but I'm much more likely to run into people who are not like me. And I'm also much more likely to run into people who voted for a different president than I did. So it's easier for me to believe that my candidate lost when she lost or he lost. Um, whereas people who tend to live in these highly segregated pro-Trump areas, they're much more likely to not know anybody who voted for, um, who voted for Biden. Yeah. I'll stop. Dr. Fisher, do you want to add on to that? I do. Uh, I'm not speculating at all. And, and the reason why I'm not speculating, and I, and I think that, you know, whoever, the person who asked that question should really think about how this whole drama played out. It didn't happen spontaneously. They had been advertising everything they were doing for months. They were literally bus tours throughout Central America, the middle part of America, where they were organizing people for that day. Did you think those people would not show up? This is exactly my point. It seems to me that there's a corpus of American people who will use any excuse to not see the reality that's right before their face. All of this stuff was orchestrated. All of it happened, one, within a tradition that had been happening over years, and all of it was telegraphed. It was a slow moving train wreck. When no one responded to what happened on January 6th, they didn't respond because they didn't want to, because they didn't believe for some reason that white supremacists would actually show up and do what they said they were going to do. So anyone who thinks that this is speculation, check your sources. So Dr. Fisher, there are a couple of follow-ups I'll do quickly, and then I'm going to move to some other questions. Um, one has to do with your reference to the uh, riot as a lynching, right? You, you draw, draw that historical parallel, and uh, the questioner is saying, you know, usually that's defined as a, you know, it's a violent murder by a mob, by a hanging. What evidence exists that these rioters planned to hang anyone or that they intended to commit murder? How many of them carried a gun? And then similarly, do you believe the views of January 6th, 6th insurrectionists a representative of all white Americans? No, I don't think that the January 6th representative uh, uh, actions are representative of all white Americans. There are plenty of white Americans who get it. But I do think the demographic uh, numbers that both Dan and Diane uh, talked about demonstrate that there's a portion of people in America who are living in a happy mythology. And they are content to live there. They're actually not content to live there. They see that mythology as being threatened. Did I, you know, what evidence did I have of there being an intent to lynch? Look behind me, I didn't make these images up. 
These are the images that the actual insurrectionists brought with them. The symbolism is very clear. And again, if you don't see it, it's because you don't want to see it. And it probably has to do with your politics. For me, this isn't about politics. This is about the historical evidence. These are things that I can prove, much like my colleague Sakia pointed out. Um, when the, you know, the, the political leadership in America began to support these white supremacist ideas, they made them go mainstream. The evidence is very clear. The population, the, 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 the people who were invested in and who participated in the KKK expanded in, you know, exponentially in the 1920s going into the 1930s. And all of that was because of, again, the way in which politicians endorsed it. And we have a large, vast archive of evidence that you can look at and you can choose to ignore, or you can say, maybe something's going on here. And for me, and, and, and I'll end it here, the question we have to ask ourselves beyond our politics is, is this good for the Republic? What kind of society can we be when we allow this to fester in our society? Dr. Fisher, thank you. I'm going to give a couple of questions now that came in on culture and popular culture to Dr. Adair. So um, these were signs, so I will use names. Vincent Taranio asks, could you really call the Turner Diaries pop culture since it's not a book that is well known outside of fascist groups and people who study them? So I want you to park that. And then a second question from Tom Foga saying, where can fact-based conservatives such as Mark Levine go to be heard when the mainstream media shuts them out? So two questions on the media side, if you'd like to respond. Yeah, um, so I, I wanna say, you know, first, uh, this, and it leads into the question about the Turner Diaries, is that, you know, when we're talking about um, some of these symbols of hate and some of the intentions perhaps at the rally and at the attack, the noose, for example, the image that I had behind me that was actually brought by um, people who participated in the, the Capitol attack, that there's a theatricality of this hate that appears throughout popular culture, right? So that like in the film Birth of the Nation, it's not by accident that the Ku Klux Klan are depicted heroically by lighting. They're also depicted heroically by wearing uniform, uniformed costumes, the white hoods, right? Riding on horses burning crosses. And in fact, this was had so much influence that the Ku Klux Klan prior to birth of a nation, there wasn't any ev evidence that they were running around on mass burning crosses in front of the, the in front of people's houses or in front of communities. But in fact, after when they started to get a huge increase in people who were interested in becoming a part of the KKK, they started burning crosses. They adopted the pageantry, the theatricality of that hateful violence act. And there's something about the power to be able to do that. The power to be able to bring a literal noose to the, the Capitol in support of a, a riot or in support of a rally or in support of an attack. There's a power behind being able to engage publicly in these types of violent hate. So when we talk about the Turner Diaries, I would argue that popular culture, yeah, it's subjective. But the Turner Diaries is this little novel that was published in 1978. This is a novel that is maintained status from 1978 through to today. Just because mainstream media doesn't advertise or post the Turner Diaries does not mean that it is not popular culture. Now, why is this important? It's important for us to understand it as popular culture so we understand what individuals are engaging with. In a January 12th article, the New York Times was among many news media outlets to talk about the significance and the lasting legacy of the Turner Diaries. Um, for, I, would, I would urge the person who asked the question to read the Turner Diaries and then analyze the over 500 video clips that ProPublica archived direct from the Capitol, the individuals posted as they breached the Capitol, over 500 videos, and to listen to the narrative and to watch what they wear, how they talk, how they're using social media in this regard. One of the things that you will see is that they, their, their demands, their claims about what they were going to do are taken directly from the Turner Diaries. The Turner Diaries is written as a personal diary of Turner. 
And one of the things that he talks about is going onto the Capitol, hanging, dragging individuals out, hanging, killing Congress in very specific, theatrically violent ways. This is something that if you go and look at the many selfies and the videos, one of the things that you will see, and one of the things that came out of the most recent hearings, is that in fact, the number of individuals who attacked the Capitol had those very intentions. Timothy McVeigh, you can go and watch his news archival footage. He talks about the significance of the Turner Diaries. One of the things I do think that is important is for us to understand that there is a diverse coalition of hate groups. So all of the groups that merged on the Capitol, they are not all the same. They are not all wearing uh, white hooded costumes, riding on horseback, correct, they aren't. They are a diverse group of individual groups and individuals that either want to uh, completely overthrow our democracy and that the basis of that is hate. Now they might hate different people, but one of the things that's been very effective currently is that their hate of different people, they've been able to come together and form a coalition and a community of millions that hate. So whether it's misogyny or a men's rights group or it's racism or it's homophobia, these are groups that challenge our, the very fabric of our lives and our democracy. So I, I would argue, yes, it is a, a version of popular culture and, um, and that it's important for us to understand this. And I think that, yes, I understand that Parler is advertised as a, an avenue for individuals who have conservative viewpoints to go and, and have a safe space um, as they've appropriated some social justice um, language. And I think that it is very important that people be able to have uh, conservative views. Um, but I think that there is a difference between conservative views and between hate. Now, let us also understand that this attack on the Capitol, people died. Timothy McVeigh killed 168 people. These actions lead to murder and death and destruction. So this isn't just a riot or a rally or someone who wanted a place to go to and voice their conservative thoughts. I would like for us to get back to I don't think we've ever been, but I would like for us to have a society where we can have individuals who have different um, you know, conservative viewpoints, but I don't see that there is a place in society for individuals who want to murder. Thank you. Dr. Bowen, a number of questions have come in about party politics and a number of things that I think you raised. Let me get a couple over to you. Um, first, uh, a sign from Jason Williams, are minority voters exhibiting false consciousness when they choose to vote Republican? And let me couple that with um, an anonymous question about, um, uh, let me get back to it here. Ah, um, I'll rephrase it a little bit to say, is the Republican party anti-democratic? And if it is for a democracy to survive, is it viable to allow anti-democratic parties to run? So that's an interesting sort of question on that. And then a third is, uh, well, several about the Electoral College, uh, which I think we could probably have a whole session on, which would be very interesting. And um, you've made, uh, there's a claim that the GOP is a broken party. How does that explain how they won the 2016 election despite running an unprecedentedly unpopular candidate and in spite of polling predicting his sure defeat? I think there's more to that question, but I'll, 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 I think I've tossed enough of your way, so why don't, why don't you see, take an opportunity to respond? Thank you. Thank you, President Foster. And thank you um, to our wonderful audience members. It's so great to interact with you. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I, you know, I, I approach this from uh, a, a, a person who studies voting behavior and, and public opinion. And so what I would suggest is that, no, it, it's not a false consciousness story here. We have lots of things that impact how we vote and how we behave politically. Um, ideology is one of them. Right, uh, uh, core values, uh, religiosity, uh, where we are born, who our parents were. Um, so no, I, I don't think it's a. I see this as I see the data that I, that I showed before about um, about the you know racial and ethnic uh, uh, you know backdrop of the two parties as indicting the Republican Party, not as saying that um, uh, voters. Uh, of you know who, who happen to be uh, black or Latinx or Asian American um, or for any other reason choose to attach themselves to the Republican Party. Um, the issue I think is that the Republican Party 
isn't trying to attract more of those voters, right? To breach even, even others who, who, uh, who might be uh, willing to, to vote for them. That's, that's the core problem. And I don't really think they're trying honestly, to reach out to those populations. And that's the issue, right? It's, 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 it reflects a perspective. And, and um, those of you who are Republicans, I'll be interested to hear if you agree with me about this. I don't think the Republican Party is trying uh, or believes that it can win a majority of American support in national elections. I don't think they believe they can. And I don't believe that they think they're willing to sacrifice ideological positions or now increasingly cultural and racial um, uh, uh, influence positions uh, in order to attract that majority. And that is incredibly problematic for democracy, right? So getting to the next question about um, is the GOP anti-democratic? Um, you, know, <laughs> both, you know, both parties have, have manipulated um, electoral rules for their benefit. This is not unique to the Republican Party. It's not gonna stop now. It's just, it's a tried and true, um, well-established part of American politics. They control the state governments, right? And state governments get to pass election law. So that we, we see these kinds of things all the time. But what happens when a party doesn't believe it can win and is no longer trying to even win through majority support? Right, that's my concern, and so I think we're at I think we're at a tipping point right now, and I'm deeply concerned about what happens in the future. Does the party see itself as as able to keep its commitments and maintain its coalition and be democratic, or will it continue or kind of push the envelope? By the way, political scientists who who uh, measure. Uh, um, uh, democratization or, or uh, try to rate the rate political parties in terms of um, uh, illiberalness show a huge spike among Republicans over the past 10 years. I mean, it's huge. It's um, a huge spike in authoritarianism and, and, and illiberalness. Um, and that's really concerning to me. I hope, I really hope those of you in the audience who are Republicans, who are conservative, um, I want to encourage you that the most important thing we can do right now is the hard work of building, right, an, a, a pro-democratic uh, Republican Party and to stop any type of anti-democratic movement in the party. Dan, can I ask you a question? Because I, because I, I'm, you know, I really found it fascinating what you're saying about this uh, question of whether uh, the National Republican Party believes or even is invested in, in trying to win a broad coalition. Might that explain how they govern? Um, one of the things that I find fascinating is that um, I've yet to see uh, an agenda that is sort of uh, activist. It's always reaction to every, reacting to everything. Is, is that sort of a reflex of that inability to win? So they basically just sort of dig their heels in and retrench on everything? Am I misreading that? No, I completely think that's right. I mean, that's part of what, what I'm trying to say. Thank you, Chris. Um, let's, let's look at what the Republicans did in the majority for two years of, of federal government, right? What, what are the big achievements? There was a failed attempt to um, repeal the Affordable Care Act. And why did it fail? Because it was unpop. Because too many Republicans knew they would lose elections if they actually carried through their policy agenda they told voters they wanted to achieve, right? So that, that initiative failed. The only other initiative was um, a, a, a passage of Trump tax cuts, right? Which funneled money uh, uh, to higher income and corporations um, and uh, uh, was, was paid for by deficit spending. Right? That's like the easiest thing possible to pass. You're giving people money from the future. It's, it's super easy, right? And that barely passed. There was no other legislative agenda. Everything else is judges, right? What does a party do? It doesn't think that it can, doesn't have a governing agenda and, and, uh, and can generate support with its policy positions. You focus on, on electing judges, right? Begin pushing judges through the courts. Um, that's a non-elected branch. You don't have to deal with that problem if the judges are enacting the policies. 
Thank you. As a practical matter, we've actually reached the 1.30 time. Dr. Bowen, is this a 1.30 thing? Because I have one more big set of questions I'd love to at least. I think Dr. Bates has to leave, but I think everyone else is available. Okay, Dr. Bates, thank you so much for your participation today. Really grateful for it. Thank you. Let me, let me do one more set of questions. It's, it comes from a number of people, some anonymous, some not. And it's essentially asking about the comparison between the January 6th protests and the George Floyd protests or events that had happened since June. Um, is the storming of the Capitol comparable to some of the lootings and burnings from June? We get that question. Um, how are those comparisons? You know, how, how do we think about those? And likewise, um, sorry, I'm wrong. Um, you know, how do we make sense of the riots of 2020 in Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, New York, et cetera, is the burning of an American flag a sign of insurrection? So we're, you know, a number of people asking uh, these kinds of questions. And I think a third one that I'd like to just add to this, um, you know, how would we feel about the police officers injured and killed by BLM or Antifa activists? So in other words, really trying to say, is, you know, is there some evenness here? Have we, you know, are we calling a draw? So I'd like some people to respond to that. And Dr. Fisher, you were specifically mentioned in one of them, but I think any of our panelists may want to jump in on that one. Well, I think if you look at what happened with George, George Floyd, um, it's, it's a different um, dynamic. Um, those protests have been part of a larger uh, conversation that had been going on for quite some time with the uh, killing of Trayvon Martin um, and with uh, organizations that were trying to get the American public, quite honestly, just to value black lives. Um, and I think with the spontaneous nature of what happened and the fact that when um, he was killed, you know, we didn't have the luxury of doing what, as a public, what we normally do, which is basically gone with our lives. Um, distraction has been a great way to keep us from dealing with social um, justice questions. Um, so once, uh, you know, that event happens and he's killed, um, it, you know, it became this sort of perfect storm of all these different kinds of coalitions that came together. And what happened, of course, with the looting and everything else that went on is that um, you would see it, and, and it was very clear, the protesters who had been part of this longer conversation just to get the American public to, to hold police accountable and to, to consider Black lives as being as valuable as any other life, um, they would hold their protest on the day, then the evening would come. And whenever the evening came, that became a whole different story, right? That's when you had all these different factions coming out. And we know that there uh, were, you know, radical groups, whether from the radical left or from the radical right, who saw this as an opportunity. So no, I, I don't see them as, a, as the same. Um, you know, when you look at the grievances that uh, were driving people on January 6th, they were operating from completely different assumptions. One of the assumptions is that they knew they can get away with it. They felt empowered in a way that the people who were protesting um, Floyd's death, they did not feel empowered. So there's a big difference between the two. Did violence happen? Absolutely. What was happening out in Portland, I mean, Portland has its own dynamic. Um, that's a completely different story. But what happened on January 6th, that, that was singular. Let me ask Dr. Adair to jump in. You you made the point about violence and, and murder having no place. Where How would you like to react to this sort of set of questions then? Uh, you're, on, you're on mute. Hi, mute. Hi, mute. Okay. Um, I, I think that it's interesting. And I think that, you know, over the summer and all through um, what happened in January, there were these conversations going on, whether it be social media or between friends or colleagues or, or whatnot. And I think the conversations are good. And it's always good if we can discuss something. Uh, I find it problematic to compare the two events. One for me is a patriotic duty to pro peacefully protest. The other is an attempt to overthrow our democracy. For me, they're not the same. 
the thing that I think is important to understand, and this goes back to a point I was making about social media being sort of a form of pop culture, is that all of us, most of us exist in these thought bubbles um, where we are only interacting, and this goes back to some of uh, Diane's uh, statistics on demographics, where we are, the news that we receive has been curated via algorithms based on all other, you know, a, a lot of publicly available data about who we are. And so it can be very easy to believe that what you think is right is right. Um, I tried my best with the BLM protests coming out in the summer to try to get a wider perspective. But I think some things that are fact and that, that maybe the, the, the public don't know, and Dr. Fisher mentioned this a little bit, is that there were a number of different groups that were taking part in the BLM protests, and some of them had um, ulterior motives. There were individuals who were coming in specifically to agitate and destroy and to create havoc that actually had nothing to do with the Black Lives Matter movement. You can find this footage, this footage online. You can find footage of uh, BLM protesters actually asking individuals to stop doing that, to, you know, you're taking away from the message. You can see time after time. You know, at the end of the day, there's not, an individual can't control what someone does at the riot or, or someone does at a protest and what it turns into. So I think that, um, you know, the BLM protest, it emerged out of years and years and years of um, anti-Black racist violence against Black Americans. Um, but it also emerged out of a very real palpable event that, by the way, was played on loop. Right, so that for hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, you're watching an individual be murdered live, and then it's played over and over again. So there's a immediacy of that that I think lends itself to people going out and marching. And like Dr. Fisher said, that's your only voice, and that is something that is is our right. And you know, in my talk, I did not say that the rally that was held was uh, wrong or incorrect or people shouldn't do that. I don't agree with the politics that were espoused at that rally, but I think that it is a part of our right as a citizen to peacefully protest and to show up and to state our, 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 our thoughts, our goals. But it's not okay to attempt to overthrow the government. BLM wasn't attempting to overthrow the government. So I think that for me, I, I don't see them as the same. Very great. So I'm going to make a little bit of a pivot now because I want to be respectful of time and I know some people are dropping off. So I want to I want to pivot the panel to a little bit of solution orientation and future. So I'm going to combine two questions here. I'll start with Dr. Bowen for the responses. Um, the first um, question from an anonymous attendee. Would the panelists be willing to give their thoughts on what they are predicting or seeing for our country over the next 10 years? given the growing diverse population. In other words, if nothing, nothing changes. And then couple that with a question about, uh, we've just, uh, from Shay, we've discussed a number of different issues such as an inability to understand others' viewpoints and the turns toward hate and violence. How do the panelists believe we should go about solving these issues? You know, it, does the duty fall perhaps under the shoulders of individuals or the federal government? So, project forward a bit and begin thinking about sort of what, what are the perhaps concrete steps or what, what has to happen for multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy. And Dr. Bowen, I'm going to give you the first, first kick at this. And this will be our last culmination. And let me just say to the panel, to the folks in the audience, we have 50 questions today. I was not able to get to all of them, but we will record all of them and make sure that people have an opportunity to get back to you. So Dr. Bowen. Uh, thank you, uh, President Foster. Um, Really great question, really important question, right? As we think about our role as citizens, um, what should we be doing as we, as we try to help our, our, our nation? Um, as far as what we're predicting into the future, you know, I think there are a couple big items that are, that are still out there um, that, that, that I don't know what's gonna happen with, and, um, but they could Im impact the things that we're talking about. The first is a push for institutional reform. I think a previous questioner had asked about you know multiple parties. Um, well, the way that you get multiple parties is that you allow uh, uh, multi-member districts in the U.S. House. Right, that's probably the best way that we would 
we would uh, be able to generate um, uh, uh, multiple parties to form. The second thing, so maybe institutional institutional reform is on is really on the table. I think here for uh, the Democrats, we could see an expansionist role for federal government to govern elections, which again might uh, might change some of the incentive structure that's facing um, both Democratic and, and Republican parties. The second thing is to see what happens to President Trump. Um, there have already been conversations, both about President Trump saying that he's going to create a, a patriot party, right, separate from the Republican Party, as well as um, former uh, uh, Bush and Reagan officials who are saying, no, we need to leave the Republican Party because Trump already owns it. And, and so there's a battle right now. All the Republican elites are in a battle about who gets, who gets to control the future of the party. And... Um, what happens in the future, I think, uh, depends on who gets control of, of that party, right? Are there, is it Trump and, and sort of the Trumpists who are learning from him about his particular uh, uh, view of uh, populist authoritarianism or are the more establishment, um, uh, maybe classic uh, GOP style uh, of, of folks? So I think those two big questions loom. Will we see institutional reform? and what happens to this internal party ba battle that's happening right now. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Adair, would you like to look forward into the future, do a little crystal ball gazing and give your thoughts on what you see coming forward? Yeah, I mean, I, and I think it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, that it is important to, to note that Trump receives millions, millions more votes popular votes than he did in 2016. I think it's important to note that because he lost the election, but he did receive more votes. And, you know, I think Professor Bowen has more of a, more of a, a sort of understanding or history of, of what that means, electoral college, popular vote and trends. But for me, looking forward, I think that is, it's crucial for people to come together across the aisle, if you will, and really talk about what are the things that are, are, are holding us back in this country from being united. And I do think that until we address these sort of vast socioeconomic um, uh, differences and uh, vast socioeconomic uh, uh, you know, privileges and, and disparities, then I think that we are going to continue to have individual groups and individuals who separate themselves. Um, and I think that for me, I was very happy when Biden won the election. That's, I, I think, fairly obvious for my politics. But I was incredibly alarmed at how many more people actually voted for Trump, even though he lost, how many more people voted. And that I think it's important that we understand that so that we can start having these conversations and start thinking of ways to unify. I also think that it is important to understand that as, as long as one sort of form of hate is conditioned, then there's going to continue to be these inequities. And that the, the, the march, uh, the attack on the Capitol is distinct in how diverse these groups were. And I know that there was a question of someone that asked, well, what about the non-white individuals who participated? And I do think it is important to note that although not a majority, there was a huge number of women that participated in the attack on the Capitol. There were a huge number of non-white individuals, not huge, but there was a number of non-white individuals who also participated. There were a number of non-white individuals who were part of the rally and um, you know, leading up to it. I think that, that I think we should do more research on our own about all of the groups that have decided to merge temporarily in this sort of attack on the Capitol and in this uh, defensive position, because the groups themselves are actually different in terms of what they want out of society. So I think going forward, more information about these groups, more conversations um, and more conversations across varying political perspectives, I think the way to go. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fisher, you'll back clean up here. Yeah, um, I, you know, I, 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 I commend both Dan and Zakia. I think that their answers were absolutely on, uh, spot on. Um, you know, 
The only thing I would add is the big question of social media in our lives moving forward um, and the way in which that, which that shapes not only our politics, but also our interpersonal relationships. Um, I think my hope is that we, um, after the hot, you know, politics of, 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 of 2020, that we get a better handle on social media in our lives. I think we've given far too much power to social media and social media corporations. Um, and I think part of that begins with, with you know, some, some good old fashioned outreach. Um, this is where I think, you know, someone I think asked a question about how do we, you know, make America more inclusive. I, I think it really does come down to just going out and meeting your neighbor, like getting out of your house, getting into communities, um, meeting people, talking with them. I know it's old, old fashioned, but, you know, that analog response, I think, is the only um, reasonable one to, you know, the power of social media where people sort of remain ensconced in their, in their, you know, their, their biases. Um, and with that, I say not only, you know, going out and meeting the pe with people and talking with them, sharing ideas, listening to them, you know, mixing it up with them in a fun way, but also remaining politically engaged. Um, one of the things that, that I think happened with uh, 2016 was that there were so many people who were just, you know, sort of you know, reading all the signals coming in out of Facebook and, and all the different, you know, platforms. Um, and, you know, and they abandon, you know, their own responsibility to do their part, to be a part of the political process. So for me, I would add just those two things to what, what, what Dan and Zakia said that, you know, we have to figure out what's going on with social media and what that means for our democracy. We assumed that the, you know, the more you have to say and the more open the conversation, it would be better for democracy. And I'm not saying it's not. I just think that we have to figure out how to moderate it, um, figure out how to fit it in. And then also we need to re reconnect with people, like really reconnect. And my hope is that after the COVID quarantines, there'll be a real hunger for people to go out and, and, and reconnect with people in real time and sit down and have lunch and talk um, and be social again. Great, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that the panelists and I talked about prior to this first panel was that we were bound to need more than one session to make sense of the moment. And obviously that's, that's the case here. We've had a lot of information put on the table, as many questions as, as I'm sure, um, you know, sort of theories and ideas here. So really, really appreciate not only our panelists, but our participants today who are excellent. Um, we will capture the questions and I'll ask those who are um, moderating this session to either help out capturing those questions. Let me also thank the sponsors. It's the Office of the President, the Office of Academic Affairs, the Division of Inclusive Excellence, and also the Department of Political Science. Please join us for panel number two. It's on Tuesday, March 9th. There will be four TCNJ professors who will share their insights on the moment, again on the moment, but this time through the lens and the topic of violence, whiteness, and white supremacy. So thank you all for participating this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you again on March 9th. Thank you. Take care, thank everyone. You. Take care.